Welcome to EOZ TV. I'm Elder. I'm Mrs. Elder. And today we're going to talk about my favorite international liar, Mahmoud Abbas. Let's do. <laughs> he gave us lots of material this week. Um, but uh, And I've been watching him for years, and he always lies, but... He came up with a new one this week. What did he come up with? I was impressed. <laughs> this yeah. is, he came up with a, a new, new lie? A new anti-Israel lie. This is a brand new one. And I'm, I, uh, you know, it gets boring to hear the same lies over and over again. So uh, when he comes up with a new one, my ears perk up. Okay, well, let's talk about it. This was a good one. Good. What he claimed was, he said, and here's the quote from the actual, um, from the official English translation. He said, Israel, since 1948, has persisted with its contempt for international legitimacy by violating UNGA Resolution 181, the Partition Resolution, which called for the establishment of two states on the historic land of Palestine. Israeli forces seized more land than that was allotted to Israel, constituting a grave breach. And he even lists the articles, Articles 39, 41, and 42 of the United Nations Charter. And then in the preamble of the resolution, it says the Security Council will determine as a threat to the peace breach of the peace of or act of aggression in accordance with Article 39 of the Charter, any attempt to alter by force the settlement envisaged by this resolution. And then he says, regrettably, the Security Council is not upholding its responsibilities to hold Israel by this resolution. Let's talk about that resolution. Let's do. In 1947, after the British decided they no longer wanted to be responsible for the British mandate for Palestine, the UN, after a few months of deliberation, decided to partition the, the uh, area of Palestine, of British Mandate Palestine, into two states. They called the two states the Arab state and the Jewish state, since they didn't have not names. The, now, under, let's talk about international law for a second. Okay. In the United Nations General Assembly does not make international law. The resolutions that it makes do not have any validity under international law. With one exception, they can become valid if both sides that are agree, both sides that are affected by the resolution agree to be bound by terms of the resolution, just like any agreement between two states. If they agree and they sign it, then it becomes international law. What happened with the 1947 partition plan? The Jewish side, the Zionist side, agreed. They weren't thrilled. They didn't like losing Jerusalem. They didn't like losing a lot of their ancestral lands. But they said, you know what? It's important for us to have a state. It's the only way to save Jews worldwide from the massacres and from all the horrors that they had uh, really had to um, endure all the, over the previous couple hundred years, both in Europe as well as in the Arab world. And they said, okay, we'll take it. We'll, we'll, we will, we'll accept the state, even with these, uh, you know, these small lines. So the Jews accepted it? Yes. <clears throat> Um, the Arabs said, no way. Well. They said, there's no possible way we're going to accept a Jewish state in any form or way. So, within hours after the resolution was passed by the mm -hmm. UN, the Arabs, the Palestinian Arabs, we're not talking about the, you know, everybody knows that, okay, five or seven or whatever Arab armies all invaded Israel or invaded the Jewish state as soon as Israel declared itself independent in, in May 1948. This is before that. This is the end of November, November 30th, 1947 is when the partition resolution came in. Within hours at the end of the resolution, um, that is as soon as it was voted on, the Arabs within British Mandate Palestine started rioting and started killing Jews. Here's a, an article from the Palestine Post which later became the Jerusalem Post saying seven Jews murdered, six Jews in, in Jerusalem bound buses, another one in Jaffa that was killed. And they were, they were just the beginning. They were killed. They were, started killing them every day. The Arabs didn't just reject this resolution. They rejected it violently. And they decided to respond to it with murder. And now Mahmoud Abbas is saying that Israel, by fighting back and by allowing itself to get to the armistice lines that became known as the Green Line, that Israel is the one that was violating this resolution, even though it was never international law, because his people never rejected accepted it. Them. They rejected it, and they violently rejected it. Not only that, but Abbas, if you look at the um, PLO National Charter, and this was on this screen over here, the 1968 PLO National Charter, as well as the 1964, and as far as, far as I know, everything up until today, um, they've never rescinded this, it says explicitly that they reject. They considered the partition illegal. They considered Resolution 181 to be 
completely illegal because it allowed the establishment of a Jewish state. Today, Mahmoud Abbas does not accept the establishment of a Jewish state, which is what it says in 1947. So he, he completely rejects the resolution today. Absolutely. And, he, and he is saying, because of his rejection, that's why it never became, or because of his people's rejection, that's why it never went into force. And now he's claiming that it has international legitimacy and that Israel, by fighting back and surviving, is the one that violated the resolution. Yeah, he's a piece of work. This is... I mean, if if he was Jewish, this would be considered the ultimate chutzpah. I don't I don't want to give him the honor of being called chutzpahdik, but uh, the uh, is, it is like it's unbelievable nerve, an unbelievable gall for him to make this claim. The media doesn't talk about this, you know. They, well, of they, course they, not. They, they don't uh, understand they, the history. He gave his speech. The New York Times had an article talking about his speech against Bibi's speech, and Bloomberg News had an article about it, and Reuters had an article. Not one of them mentioned this egregious lie. That Mahmoud Abbas made? Well, probably because uh, they really don't know the history, and that's why we're here to tell it. Well, part of it is that they don't know the history. The other part of it is because they don't want to know, because they want to position Mahmoud Abbas as the most moderate, peacemaking, you know, Arab leader that there is, and they can't say that if he's lying all the time. So they just would rather not cover the lies. They'll tell uh, Bibi, you know, Netanyahu, they're going to say, oh, he's a right-wing extremist, and everything he says, they'll look, you know, they'll, they'll look at every single word and, and try to come up with uh, ways of finding ways that what he's saying is racist or terrible or something like that. Mahmoud Abbas gets a pass from the media. Yeah, isn't that pretty incredible? And that's just, that's just one of the lies that he made this week. Um, there were other ones. So tell us more. Sure. The, um, he said, ooh, this is, uh, sorry, this is not as big as it should be, but um, Mahmoud Abbas said also in his speech that we stand against terrorism in all its forms and manifestations and we condemn it by whomever and wherever. This is also a lie because last year... Look at who he's holding hands with. Yes, oh my he's God. holding hands with two murderers. This is, uh, this is a couple of years ago. He is uh, celebrating the release of uh, prisoners in the prisoner swap deal. And these are murderers and he's celebrating them. And this is what he said literally to the UN last week, that he condemns terrorism in all its forms. He sure. doesn't. He He's the celebrates. one who originates it. Right, he celebrates it, and he originates it. The, um, this poster that I made last year ended up being more um, prophetic than I thought it was. I made this poster last year. He made a similar, um, he, made, he said the same sort of thing in both speeches last year and this year. He says, we're working on spreading a culture of peace and coexistence between our people and in our region. He's, he, in other words, he was claiming that that the Palestinian Authority is really working hard to te teach its peace people a culture of peace. Please. And I pointed out last year that he was a liar, because literally two weeks before that, he said, we welcome every drop of blood spilled in Jerusalem, pure blood, clean blood, blood on its way to Allah. So he's encouraging people to get themselves killed while they attack Jews. He calls them all shahids. Every shahid will reach paradise. Everyone wounded will be rewarded by Allah. This is the same speech where he said that any Jews that enter the Temple Mount, the holiest site in Judaism, have filthy feet. This was his first, you know, his, this is his direct incitement. Now, after I made this poster, and literally the day after he gave his speech in the UN, was the first of the wave of murders of Israelis, the, the mini knife intifada. It started off not with knife. It started off with a... Um, the, the, the shooting deaths of the Henkin couple that were driving and uh, with their children in the car. But it was quickly followed by a whole series of knife attacks and car ramming attacks against Jews. And all of them, in the Arab media, the reason they gave for them, they didn't give, say, oh, it's because of hopelessness. They didn't say it was because of, there was no peace horizon or anything like that. The reason they gave was the exact same reason that Mahmoud Abbas said when he was encouraging them to do this violence. They said they're doing it to defend Al-Aqsa from the Jews. He started it. His words were the ones that were used in order to justify it. And again, I made this poster before the whole knife intifada started, but this, it was, he was clear he was a liar then, and right now it's so much more clear he was a liar because dozens of Jews have been attacked and killed since then, and uh, not only Jews, you know, non-Jews as well that they thought were Jews. And he is now still trying to go to the UN and pretend that he is such a man of peace. Well, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. From their history, it looks like they've carried the terrorism to every other country, including America. 
Um, the Palestinians, um, they started off that way, certainly, in uh -huh. the 1970s when they wanted to get attention. They started off with uh, hijackings. Um, the, um, the person who assassinated Bobby Kennedy was a Palestinian. There was a lot... After they, uh, they, afterwards, they made a conscious decision to only attack Jews and only attack, uh, really, Jews that were in, um, you know, as far as the Palestinians were concerned, like Fatah and Hamas. They, they generally try to stay within their Israel, mostly because they realized they were losing European support if they kept attacking Europeans, and they were losing American support if they kept attacking Americans. So instead, they decided, hey, we'll only attack Jews, and we'll only attack, you know, anybody who's on, on either side of the Green Line, really, and nobody's going to care. And, uh, and it worked. The strategy worked 100%. Um, well, other Arabs obviously do. It's um, Hamas, you can say, is, you know, Hamas has the same philosophy as Al-Qaeda and ISIS, and in many ways it does, even though it tries to distance itself, itself from it. Um, they're both Islamist groups. Both of them want to have to replace, um, you know, to replace the entire Middle East with a caliphate. Um, that you know that it's only going to have uh, that only its allegiance, you know, using only Islamic law. Um, Fatah is on the fence about stuff like that. Uh, Hamas mm -hmm. and Islamic Jihad certainly um, believe in that, but they've made a calculated decision to try as much as possible to keep their attacks on only Israelis and only Jews. Uh, Hezbollah, which is in Lebanon, is, uh, does a lot more than that. Hezbollah actually does attack um, other targets, usually also Jews, but Jews in Europe, Jews in, in South America. That certainly has happened. There's, um, but again, Jews are still the target in general. No, I understand that, but the terrorism has now spread all over where there's Terror murders. Certainly the, the, the godfather of modern Islamic terrorism was Yasser Arafat. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, with, with, you know, what happened in the Olympics and what happened in the, again, all of the airplane hijackings in the 1970s, they were the ones that started everything. Suicide bombings were mostly popularized by, uh, by Palestinians. No, the reason why I'm asking is that you see in America all these malls and all these terrorist attacks. Is there any affiliation whatsoever it's with that? It's not a direct affiliation, but the ideas of, you know, are certainly taken from the Palestinians. That's, I, not, that's, a, that's not even a question. The, uh, a lot of these attacks No, but a lot of people don't see them. the correlation, and that's why I would, wanted to go a little bit in that direction, because people don't get that the Palestinians are the roots of this terrorism, and it's actually spread throughout the world, and it's uh, continuing on, and that's what they have to share with all of us, is their terrorism. And, and, and that's an interesting point, because again, they, they will try very hard to claim that they are not. However, yes. on the other hand, the um, Mahmoud Abbas will say to anybody who wants to listen to him, he'll say that unless we get what we want, then terrorism is going to continue. So he, he also makes a link to it, but he tries to do it in the opposite way. He says, unless Israel gives us everything we demand from Israel, then you're still going to have ISIS, and you're still going to have... In other words, he's trying to use it as blackmail. He's, going to, he's trying to That's explain all they to do. the Europeans and to the Americans, and says, hey, you have to impose your, a peace plan on Israel that's acceptable to us, because we're going to be the ultimate arbiters. If we decide that it's not good enough, then ISIS is going to keep doing what it was, which means that Abbas is sort of saying, hey, you know, I almost can control ISIS. He's not quite saying that to, you know, directly. And if you ask him, of course, he's going to say, no, no, of course not. I'm very much against what they're saying. But he claims, ISIS doesn't even claim this. ISIS has barely mentions Israel. Of course, the way they mention Israel, they say they hit Israel. No, he's hijacking that too to his benefit. Right. He's trying to say, you know what? If you guys are scared of international terrorism, then you've got to get Israel in line. It's complete garbage. There's no linkage between the two. But this is one of the things that Abbas tries to say. And when he says that, he himself is putting in a link between international terrorism and what, what he claims he needs Israel hey, to do. Hey, that's the way he's getting PR. It you works. know what I mean? No, and so the works. thing is, is that what are we going to do to actually fight back? That's a very good question. Um, but that wasn't the, um, even that wasn't the only thing that Abbas said that was ridiculous this week. Yeah, let's talk about more about what Abbas said. Yeah, that there's, was ridiculous. A, there's something else that I, I mentioned today. Um, he said, he, he, before he came to New York, he went to Venezuela. And he spoke to a number of Palestinians there. There are a lot of Palestinians who actually settled in South America. They're citizens, and yet the world still considers them refugees. Um, Pretty incredible. So, yeah, so he went to Venezuela to the um, meeting of the non-aligned movement. And he said a number of things there, like, for example, saying that uh, the reason the Palestinians started um, on the first anniversary, actually, of, the, uh, of Abbas's speech last year, where he talked about the... Um, you know, the filthy feet speech that I mentioned before, 
um, on the literally on the first anniversary, the Palestinians started you know bringing out knives and and stabbing Jews again. Nobody really has noticed that it was the first anniversary, but Palestinians are very Palestinian Arabs are very very sensitive to anniversaries. And uh, I don't think it's coincidence that the latest stabbing attacks all started on the same date, September 16th, one year later. But what Abbas said over here is also to when he was speaking to Venezuela, he said that uh, there's, uh, he, he barely talked, when he was at the UN, he barely talked about what, what's called the right of return. That's a, a key Palestinian demand is that Palestinian Arabs should be able allowed to move into Israel if they you know if their ancestors happen to live in what is now uh, considered Israel, and he wrote and he said to them there are six million Palestinian refugees and I am one of them I am a refugee it is true that I live in Ramallah but Ramallah is not my city I have not returned to my native city um, meaning uh, Tzfat Safed is where he came from and I'm entitled to demand my right of return for I'm a refugee who lost his land and his homeland and he tweeted the same thing. There are six million Palestinian refugees who are waiting to receive what they are entitled to, waiting to be allowed to return to their homes. Now, let's think about that. First of all, there aren't six million refugees there. Uh, according to the UN, there's five million. If you actually count the number of real refugees, by any definition, it's about 30,000 that's <laughs> left. Um, because that's about the number that's alive right now, left from 1948. By no other definition are the uh, children of refugees and the descendants of refugees forever considered refugees, except by the UN and because of UNRWA, but that's a, that's a whole other story. So anyway, he's exaggerating the number that, that you know, even according to UNRWA. But if you go beyond that, and, and there is no right of return, that's another thing that's very important to keep in mind, and that's another story we can, we can go into much more detail. There is no right that anybody can just go back to whatever country that, that their ancestors used to live in. That's just not true. Okay. Um, however, this is, what's important over here is that he, did, he made a slight mention of it at the UN, but every time Abbas talks in Arabic, he makes a big deal about return. He's saying there will be no peace unless we have the right to return. The whole reason that he talks about a right to return is to destroy Israel. And this has been known for decades. Like over here, I have a quote from, um, from Gamal Abdel Nasser, the, um, the, the head of Egypt, the president of Egypt in, uh, in the early 60s. He said in an interview, if the Arabs return to Israel, Israel will cease to exist. And there was also uh, the, uh, and the refugee conference in, in Syria in 1957 said, any discussion aimed at a solution to the Palestine problem not based on ass assuring the refugees' right to annihilate Israel will be regarded as a desecration of the Arab people and an act of treason. So the, what they refer to is their, you know, they know that when they say they want to return, it's to destroy Israel demographically. They want to flood Israel with these people, with these Arabs, and therefore... There won't be a Jewish majority, and then they can all vote, and they can be no. There'll be no Jewish state anymore. That's the entire reason that they insist on the right of return. That's the entire reason why the Arab nations have not allowed Palestinians to become citizens. They allow other Arabs to become citizens. They do not allow Palestinians to become citizens. This is the entire reason is to destroy Israel, and Abbas insists on this in Arabic whenever he talks to any Arab crowd. That's you know that's what he does. It's his mo. That's what he does exactly. So over here. When, he's, when he goes back and he's encouraging the refugees to, you know, saying that they all can go back, think about this. Two million out of those five million so-called refugees live in the West Bank and Gaza. In other words, they live under his control or under Hamas's control. He's the first world leader in history to encourage his own people to leave his country, to go somewhere else. He wants two million of his own people to leave. <laughs> Because he wants to destroy Israel. There's no other reason. You know, if he really wants a state, he's going to want everybody to go to his state. He's going to want to control them. If he wants to make a state of Palestine that's going to be a place where these so-called refugees and these stateless people have a, you know, can go and live and thrive, he would want them to come to his state. He wouldn't want them to go to another state. That doesn't make sense. His entire purpose of emphasizing the whole refugee issue is to destroy Israel. He knows it. The Arabs have known it for decades, as I just shown. Israel knows it, and the West knows it. However, even the West knows it. However, he doesn't want to talk about it to the West so much right now. He talks about it in Arabic, but in the UN he just says, oh, we have to come up with a just resolution to the problem. That's all he's going to say. But when he talks to his own people, he says, you know what the resolution is? The resolution is that we are all going to go back to Israel. And then there's going to be two Palestinian states. One will be called Israel, but it won't be Jewish anymore, and the other one will be Palestine. But that's exactly what he wants to do. So he is just so dishonest. 
And 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 how he talks, you know, to the UN and how he talks to everybody else. You can know what you can find out what the truth is. And the reporters and the diplomats don't bother checking this stuff out. They don't bother looking for the truth. He's he's one I know, of the it's most, really sad. He it's most accomplished liars in history. Him and you know, and Saya Barakat is, is another one. Um, you know, they're, his, his, <laughs> they're just they're so so amazing at lying, and nobody fact checks them. It just it drives me crazy that the, that this doesn't happen. That they report every once in a while. There be he, he goes a little bit over the line. Over the summer, he said that uh, you know Jews were poisoning the wells. And when people finally asked him and said, "Where are you getting that from?" He backtracked and he said, "Oh, okay, I was misinformed." But um, that's only when somebody actually calls him, and that's only because the Israeli government made a big deal over it. And then that's the only reason the reporters came back to it is because Israel made it into a news story. But. And this, to me, is to me is partially the fault of the government of Israel for not making a big deal over this. Why didn't they even say a word about what he said about in in the UN about the uh, you know about Israel supposedly violating Resolution 181? Because he does it's, it all the time. He does it all the time. But Israel is the only one that can make it into a news story because the reporters are not going to do their job. So that's why we're making it into a news yes, story. Yes, we're, we're trying to, but well, we let's have do to, it. We got to be, get bigger, and in order for us to get bigger, we need help. We sure do. <laughs> So whatever you guys can do to help us, whether it's monetary or whether it's also helping us out with stories or, or anything else, um, we can actually... Or even your expertise, like you may have a, uh, like you may be a graphic artist, who knows, you may have a specialty that you can help join um, us fight this fight. Yeah. And we'd love to have you. So right. please let us know. Exactly. Or if you know reporters or if you know, um, you know, members of Congress or, or members of, uh, of government that would be interested in the truth, you know, we can work together and try to get this information out because this is important. That, and, it's, and the reporters themselves, the journalists, are the, one, they're the ones that are really supposed to be checking these sort of things, as well as NGOs. They're completely dropping the ball because there is a bias there. And this, we, we just proved the bias. The fact that they're not covering these stories shows the bias. They, you know, uh, Netanyahu will say one thing and they go crazy. Abbas says the most outrageous things. They don't say a word. There's well, we're going to say a word and we're going to keep this happening. And so in order to keep this happening, we need you and you become part of our team. Okay? Agreed. Very good. So for now, I'm Elder. I'm Mrs. Elder. And this was EOZ TV. See you next time.